Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and the brightest in the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Dr. Paul White, a psychologist, researcher, New York Times bestseller, and the co-author of The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace. Pretty timely right now. And Paul has decades of experience consulting clients from family businesses to landmark companies, little companies you might have heard of, Microsoft, L'Oreal, DirecTV, ExxonMobil, Miller Coors, Nationwide Insurance, to name a few, and not to mention over 750 colleges and universities. And Dr. Paul White has sold well over half a million copies of The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workforce and has since released two other books about avoiding and correcting toxic workplaces as well as building a culture of appreciation. Interesting, a culture of appreciation. And we're going to unpack that. And Dr. White is also an avidly sought out keynote speaker and works hands on with organizations to improve their work environments. And as an operator myself in the world of talent access, I could definitely appreciate the work that Dr. Paul does to improve the world of work. So let's get to it and find out more all about how it's done. Dr. Paul White, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Adam. Glad to be with you. Uh, pleasure, a pleasure on this side. And thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. So let's start. And I really want to bring my tribe up to speed on your story, your career, your life story. Um, an undergrad, I mean, you, you study Christian education at Wheaton, uh, for your bachelor's. Um, what took you down that path? What took you down the path to study Christian education? Yeah, I was, uh, I grew up in a pretty conservative Midwestern family and home outside of Kansas City, uh, went to Wheaton College in Chicago. There's one in Massachusetts as well, but this one's in Chicago. And um, really had a desire to, you know, make the world a better place. And uh, from my sort of religious upbringing, that seemed to be the best pathway and learned about how people learn, how they change, um, and try to provide structure to help them do that. So that, that was sort of the pathway at that point in time. And did you always have your mindset on going for your doctorate, or is that something that evolved during your during education? Yeah, no, that came up quite a bit later. Actually, I took one psychology course in my undergrad because I had to. I really wasn't too interested in psychology per se. So uh, now that developed over time. Well, it's interesting too. I'm going to go off script here for a moment. You know, you look back to you know your days in college, which were uh, a while back. I think that's safe to say. Even I could say a while back yeah. at this <laughs> at this point. It's been 20 years. That's it's true. been 20 years for me. I mean, I, I sometimes I look. I'm like. Damn, geez, 20 years, that, that went fast. But you think about organizational psychology and you think now, I mean, do you think that, you know, the young folks coming out of school now are at an advantage or disadvantage coming into the workplace versus when you came out of school, when I came out of school even? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I graduated in 79, you know, in the past millennium. And so... Yeah, the year uh, I was born, it's a great year. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I mean... Um, the workplace was not um, an easy place to find a job. You had to sort of start low and work your way up. And I think uh, that's true to some degree now. I think a difference now is that uh, a degree, uh, an educational degree, doesn't necessarily open the door. And it also doesn't mean as much as it used to. And so the path is different. But I think actually there's the starting point is a little bit easier in that, you know, if you want a job, you can get a job. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, it's interesting, too. I mean, we talk about internships. We talk about work-life experience. I mean, my kind of thought, too, I think it has a lot to do, and I love your take on it, with social media, instant gratification. And, you know, I think that there's image, there's optics. You know, the the young folks these days, they see with the airplanes and the cars and the, and the piles of money. And I don't think we had that as much back then. Well, it wasn't uh, bombarding us as much, for sure. And I would say a key theme across my career development really has been 
uh, persistence and perseverance. Um, when I uh, applied to get my master's in counseling at Arizona State, I actually was turned down because I didn't have enough sort of practical experience or hadn't demonstrated a long enough interest in it. So uh, I was put on a sort of probation list. And if I did certain tasks, did some volunteer work and uh, took a couple of classes sort of, you know, um, on, on the com, you know, that if I, I did okay, it was all right. And, uh, and so I did, you know, and I, I worked it out and got uh, accepted and went through and did fine. And then the same thing happened for my PhD. After I actually went sort of one of the longer routes. You go, got my master's in counseling two and a half years, got some practical experience along the way, which was really helpful. Uh, it paid internship. And then we had to work afterwards before you could apply for the PhD. And then for my PhD, I was actually uh, um, an alternate. Uh, they, they only accepted five students in the department. I was number six. But then uh, the number one of the top five uh, dropped out. And so I I got in and, 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 and went. The rest and is so, <laughs> yeah, and you just sort of keep going, and, you know. And, right. Yeah, it's, and, the, and, and then I got, you know, I worked hard and got the outstanding doctoral student award uh, for the department when I graduated. And, and then uh, so there's been some other work experiences like that. As well. Yeah, so let's talk about some of that early work experience. I mean, was there one, you know, early stumble, early mistake that you made that, you know, at the time when it happened, Dr. Paul, like, you're like, oh, man, I, that was, that could have been brutal. But you look back on it now and thank, thankfully, you had that experience and you learned from it. Not so much a mistake, but just you, you really had to start almost below bottom. I mean, my first job was Humbling. working as a uh, hmm. a night counselor, so on uh, supposedly uh, as a residential treatment for adolescents. And basically, I was a security guard to try to you know just whenever the kids ran away, I had to make a report and tried to keep them from you know fighting and stuff like that. And it was. You know, eleven to seven graveyard, um, and tough shift. I was not. I'm not a night person. Did that, and then moved on to working in adolescent treatment for out of control adolescent guys. You know, get attacked, and then you work for. I was a child protective services caseworker for a while. Put in the work, learned a lot. So you know, you pay your dues. At least that's the way it worked for me, and I think a lot of people in my generation, you sort of. Paid your dues as you went along. Yeah, it's an interesting concept too. I and mean, we could probably spend an hour just talking about the idea of paying your dues, but we're we're not going to do that now. Um, so you you moved on and you got into the world of you know coaching and consulting and on family businesses. And for for anybody who doesn't really understand what what what's the definition of a family business? In well, family, you know, eighty five percent of the companies in the U.S. are family owned, including you know, a lot of the top ones. Uh, basically, they're uh, businesses that were started by family members. Um, and uh, what lots of times it was a husband and wife early on, or maybe a father and son, and then they they've grown it over time. And you know, most restaurants, dry cleaners, uh, car washes, uh, I mean, uh, all your sort of service industry kinds of things are family owned. And then you get into manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. So the cha and I grew up in the context of the family business, and that's sort of how I wound up there. Um, and you know, you have the challenges of both working together. Uh, you know, a father and son or two brothers um, and the, that challenge. And then the part that I worked with was it's called business succession of how to help make plans for the next generation and who's going to own it, and who's going to run it and how are you fair to the rest of the family? Well, that's interesting, too. So let's get into some of those, you know, challenges when it comes to succession. I mean, there's got to be I mean, family dynamics has to be the number one. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, just lack of foresight and planning. I mean, what are what are some of those big challenges? Well, it's not so much the lack of foresight and planning, but it's the, the lack of implementing the, the planning, because the big issue is really sort of the hidden question of how are you going to be fair to everybody? So you have somebody who's working in the business, have sort of some sweat equity, and, you know, they should maybe get some more than the person who, who uh, hasn't worked in the business or, you know, maybe another sibling who is not interested in the business at all. And, you know, so two, let's call it two brothers get, you know, the business 50, 50 when their uh, folks retire and get out. And so what sister get, you know, and so how, how do you deal with the fairness and, and fairness is, you know, always perception. It's not never reality and it changes over time. So you, you have that issue. And, um, and it, and that's how I wound up into the five languages of appreciation. I was working with a family business, Talking to the the fathers in North Carolina, I said, you know, how's the plan going? He says, it's fine. My son's stepping up. I think we're going to work it out. 
walk across the hall, talk to the son. I say, you know, how do you think it's going? He says, this is a disaster. I can't ever please my dad. It's never good enough. And so saw sort of this disconnect between the two. And, and um, Dr. Chapman, my co-author, had written the five love languages, which is, you know, one of sort of the eternal bestsellers. It sold 20 million copies. Um, and, um, and so took those uh, concepts and tried to apply them to the workplace. So let's talk about that. I mean, let's, what, what are some of the similarities between the appreciation, love appreciation and workplace, you know, appreciation? Well, they're the same in name. There's five languages. There's words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, tangible gifts, and even physical touch, which in New York is just sort of a nod at your head across the room. Exactly. But, uh, um, but you know, obviously we didn't want to use the concept of love in the workplace, but felt like appreciation was the equivalent. Uh, and I would say this is where another, you know, example of perseverance. I actually pursued Dr. Chapman, who was a best-selling author. I pursued him for a year before I could meet with him and Interesting. pitched the ID, idea of creating an online assessment, which uh, it's called the Motivating by Appreciation Inventory. It had 300,000 people take it worldwide. Incredible. And uh, so, you know, so like a, a business success guy that I knew said, yeah, my my overnight success took 10 years, you know, in the planning, but then it happened all at once, you know. There's so no such thing as an overnight success. Not many, not many. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so I, I'm always curious, especially with, with a book of, you know, and all working, you know, what was it like working with, uh, you know, Dr. Chapman? What, what did you learn from him about the book writing process, about the creative process that kind of opened up your eyes? Or maybe just something you well, maybe it's something that you apply to your your actual day to day work for yourself. Yeah, first of all, he is just a great guy. I mean, I call he's from North Carolina. I call him sort of the consummate gentleman. He's uh, just sort of gentle and but uh, and listens, but gives appropriate input and uh, was supportive. He hasn't micromanaged the process. He said, you know, I'm sticking with marriage and family stuff. You take it to the business place, and so we've done that and. I, you know, I actually, you know, sort of wrote the first draft of the book while I was traveling for a year and then got it to him and sent it to him and got back uh, his version with edits. And, uh, you know, I, it, I choked up because it, it, it felt like he I, I did sort of like the equivalent of a framer and he was more like a, you know, a cabinet maker, you know, fine with and he just fine tuned it. And, and uh, he's really, really good at uh, using stories to help communicate principles. And I think that's a key, you know, in all communication, whether it's written or oral. Dr. Paul, who's, who's this book for? Who should pick it up? It is actually for anybody in the workplace. You don't have to be a leader. Uh, and in fact, in most organizations that we work with, we don't start top down. You know, one of the deals is that, you know, appreciation and recognition are, are misconstrued. Uh, uh, a lot of people are familiar with employee recognition programs where, you, you know, you get an award for employee of the month or whatever. It's very organizational, very top down. Appreciation, we really believe is about the person, the people have value beyond their performance. And so it can be among colleagues, it can be across departments. So you don't have to be a positional leader. We usually start in the middle somewhere, have a team take uh, our, our book, our online assessment, our training, and run from there. And so, uh, and interesting, I mean, we're used by every branch of the military. We've got mining companies that use us, manufacturing. So it's not this sort of touchy feely kind of thing that's just for, it's, you know, uh, people, people don't want to feel good. That's not actually the, the goal. People, people want to be recognized. They want to feel valued. I mean, when I, when people ask me yeah. to define culture, you know, I, a big part of it for me based on my career work and life experience is feeling recognized that what I'm doing is helping. That's making a difference that, people see me, that they, they see me right. work. And I think that's what's missing out there. And especially now when, when so many folks have moved to remote work, how, how could we ensure recognition in this remote workforce time that we're going through? Yeah, well, we've actually published uh, three research studies this past year with working from home uh, individuals and found that uh, it, there's some key principles that you can do to make it work. One is you need to be proactive because when people are working remotely, you don't see them. They don't walk by your office. You don't see them in the break room or whatever. So if you don't reach out to them, it's not going to happen. Um, secondly, one of the key things that we found out about appreciation is, yeah, people want to be appreciated by their supervisor, but they also want to be uh, appreciated and valued by their peer peers and their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so 
encouraging that. And then the third thing, in fact, a, a research study just came out in the Harvard Business Review this last week on that when colleagues communicate and have a personal relationship, a friendship, you know about one another's lives, work goes better and more work gets done. So it's, I think we need to get past this sort of just objective, very uh, sort of static kind of way of relating to each other and and find out what, what happened over the weekend and, you know, how your kids did in the soccer game and that kind but of stuff. But how do you do that in a, in a genuine way versus just a BS? You're on a Zoom call. I'm like, hey, Dr. Paul, happy Monday. Uh, so uh, you're shooting the shit. You know, how was how was your weekend? How are the kids? How was soccer practice versus like genuinely caring? And the other side of that, too, is what's do you always have to be at a 10? Like, out of, you know, you always have to, yeah. right? Like, you always have to be that. Like, how do you, genuine, so, genuine I mean, appreciation, the, right? Like, genuine, heartfelt, yeah. not just BS because you had to, because, you know. Well, in fact, I mean, we talk about authentic appreciation. We're not about have, trying to teach people how to look like they appreciate somebody. And we actually talk about what do you do when you don't appreciate somebody. And and one of the things you don't do is you don't try to fake it. You don't try to just blow smoke. People can right? see right because through people, it, of course. They can see through it and it undermines trust. So one of the ways that you communicate authentically, one is that you share some about yourself. I mean, you model it and say, hey, you know, uh, I got to go sailing with my brother this weekend or I got, you know, got to go to one of my grandson's soccer games. It was actually better than I thought it was going to be. You know, so you share a little bit that opens up the door for them to be able to share at least that same level. Right. The second thing that's different about sort of just you know, going through the motions is that we know that the more specific you are in what you're saying, especially like about appreciation, uh, the more likely it's to be viewed as genuine. So, for example, we got 100,000 people on our newsletter list. We do polls, found out that one of the things that people don't like to hear is good job. Why? Because it's vague. It's general. It's like you a dog. Say it to, say it to a dog. The, yeah, you can say it to <laughs> a little dog, child. You know, and it doesn't take any thought. So if you want to really communicate appreciation verbally, you want to use their name. And if you're writing it, spell it, their name correctly, say something specific about what they did that you value and why it's important either to you, the organization, your clients. So the more specific you are, the more likely they're going to say, yeah, I, you know, he knows what's going on. I think that's a really good tip for anyone out there in a, in a leadership at any level position is to really just keep your eyes open and listen and watch for those moments, right? Look for those moments of, it, right? It's almost like a self-awareness piece is a, from a leadership perspective, being yep. awareness. And, and it, I mean, I try to do it as a leader myself. And when I hear the way I work in my, in my world is if I get great feedback from a, from a client about one of the, one of the, one of the folks on my team as quickly as possible, I'm going to relay it to that to them. I'm going to be like, Hey, Kevin, I just spoke to our client over here. And I just want to let you know that they said you did a really good job on X, Y, and Z. And then I'll add my right. own kind of color commentary to it. And that goes a long way. People want to hear yeah. that and they want to know that there's that communication loop. Yeah. And people often ask me, okay, are there generational differences? And again, we do research. A couple of years ago, we did research with 80,000 people to find out if, and actually just published another one on generations. And one of the differences is that boomers and, and us old people, you know, grew up thinking that, uh, you know, handwritten notes were, you know, the, the, the best thing ever. Uh, probably because we, you know, we had to write our grandparents a handwritten note if we got a gift, right? Um, but for younger employees, especially younger twenty-something guys, they don't give a rip about handwritten no. stuff. But it's the speed in which you get back to them. If you don't get back to them within a day or two, you've mi moved into history and, and missed the opportunity. So you need to get back, whether it's by text or voicemail or whatever. Hey everybody, first I'd like to thank you all for spending time with me and my guest on the podcast. This show is my canvas to showcase amazing people from the world of recruiting, entrepreneurship, and leadership, and unpack their career journeys for everyone to learn from. But this show is also a business generator for me, as well as creating thought leadership and endless amazing content. And I've taken what I've learned in the past three years and over 200 recorded and 100 live shows and distilled it down into a digital playbook that I call the Pause Course. Now you could learn how I build, manage, and produce the podcast and use it to drive real business development and relationships. Today, I'm sharing all of my secrets behind the podcast, and you can get it all at thepausecourse.com. This course is for anyone, whether you're starting out or an advanced podcast, you're using it for B2B, a B2C. It's filled with all of my insights, learnings, tips, tricks, and templates. So get it now at thepausecourse.com and learn all my secrets. Thanks.
So let's talk about, you know, what's happening right now. There's a lot of turnover. People call it the great resignation. I call it the great migration. People are moving mm -hmm. from, from one job to another, or they're moving from a full-time job into a side hustle that's turned into their entrepreneurship journey. But in your experience, I mean, what's the number one cause of employee turnover? Is it more, you know, interpersonal boss company related? Is it job satisfaction? I mean, where do you see it from your research as a breaking point? Yep. So in the old days, uh, there was a saying, people don't leave a job, they leave a manager, right? And uh, that's not as true anymore. Uh, more and more people are more concerned about their relationship with their colleagues and peers. And so actually we've got research that shows that 79% of the people who leave a job voluntarily cite a lack of appreciation as one of the key reasons that they leave. Most managers, one study shows 89% of managers say that most people leave for money. Same study, only 12% of mm. the employees said they're leaving for more money. They may get more money, but that's not the reason they're leaving. The reason they leave is it's an emotional process to leave a job. Right. You know, like and, after marriage, to find a right? and so it takes an emotional driver. And it's when you feel like nobody gives a rip about what you're doing, then you say, oh, screw this. I'm out of here. I'm going to find some other I've place. Seen, I've seen it firsthand in very close personal relationships where people just don't. It goes back to the values, not feeling valued and appreciated that you're not you're not yep. being seen there. Um Interesting. Let's talk about boundaries in the workplace for a moment. I mean, are there universal boundaries in, in working environments or is like each workplace different? And how do you, the question but, is like, how, like, how do you discover as a new employee or even a manager, like how do you discover boundaries and how do you uh, establish, and I hate to use the word enforce, but yeah, how do you enforce boundaries? Well, the easiest way to discover a boundary is to break it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, Podcast over. You know, <laughs> there you go. But, you know, no, I would say there aren't universal boundaries because, hey, you know, not only in the United States and in Canada, I mean, there's all kinds of subcultures. You know, you got the West Coast, you got the Northeast, you've got the, the Southeast, uh, you've got the, the Hispanic culture. And, you know, our stuff is used in China and in Europe and all that. And they're very, very different. And so you got to understand the culture. I mean, part of it is you observe. So just cool your jets and observe a little bit. Um, and then and then if you're not sure, ask a trusted colleague and say, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what sort of the norm is here and and ask them. But, you know, like so one of the languages is physical touch. Right. And people say, ah, you know, in the workplace. Ah, well, it's in New York, yeah, literally, I mean, in physical touch is nodding and saying, hey. Right. But in the southeast, they give side hugs. But what we found is basically spontaneous celebration. Right. I mean, it's a high five. Yep. when you finish a project, a fist bump when you solve a problem, maybe a congratulatory handshake. So it's not a big deal. It's less than one percent of the population. Uh, values that as their primary way of being shown appreciation. And um, so the the best and sort of easiest ways to start with words, words of affirmation, words that are affirming. 46% of all employees choose that as their primary. It's less than half. So if you only use words, you're only hitting the target with less than half of your people. Right. But it's easy to start. It's not, you know, unless you do it publicly, 40% of all employees do not want to go up in front of a large group to oh, see, no, uh, to be recognized. So do it privately in writing, just person on person. You're good to right. Go. But I mean, but how does that shift it digitally? I mean, digital boundaries. I mean, that's that's a real interesting one, too. And we're not just talking about, you know, time of day, you know, your boss emailing you on a on a on a Sunday night. But, you know, in, in written communication, boundaries are written communication. I think that's a. Uh, a threshold that a lot of uh, younger folks have, I think, mastered a little bit more because they're digitally native versus some of us older, older folks where we're used to the in-person boundaries. Right, right. So, you know, I, I think the the whole discussion really circles around an issue of w what I would call perspective taking ability, being able to see situations from other people's perspective, which our culture sucks at. I mean, uh, and and, you know, people talk about empathy. Man, you are jumping the gun if you're talking about empathy, if you don't understand the other person's perspective, because you can't feel what they feel or understand what they're feeling unless you understand their life, how they're viewing it. And to be honest, I mean, I think that is a deficit in younger employees and younger people, whether employed or not, because of sort of the digital communication, because they haven't had as much experience reading a room and, you know, coming in and, and sort of picking up on the nonverbals. Interesting neuroscience coming out showing that nonverbal communication happens far quicker than verbals. That's why you can walk into a room and read it, it and sort of figure out what's up before anybody says anything. Right. And so 
it's important sort of line of communication. Yeah, I mean, about. empathy is interesting. I think that it's a buzzword that, and it's almost, in my opinion, just kind of my hot take on it. It's almost this reverse feeling where you want people to think you're empathetic, but you really, because because that's what you want to be seen as, but you don't really know what it means to be empathetic. And people are acting yeah. the way that people think that they should be empathetic versus actually doing it and taking an action. As to what you said before, Doc, is listening, putting yourself in another person's shoes and understanding their perspective before you even react to them. Right. Or and ask questions. I mean, lots of times we don't get to know, know the person. You know, we talked earlier, I mentioned about, you know, when you don't appreciate somebody early on. So I've been doing this 11, 12 years. Yeah. Early on, I'm like, okay, well, you just sort of try to really appreciate them and ground it out. Well, it doesn't work. What I've learned is that appreciation flows from valuing a person. And to value somebody, whether or not it's performance or just who they are, you need to get to know them. And if you don't appreciate somebody, a good way to sort of work on that is spend some time and find out where they came from, where they go to school, what's their life like. You're going to develop some touch points, whether they're, you know, a Yankees fan or they hate the Yankees, you know, or whatever it might be. And then then it sort of flows from there. How hard is it for extroverts, uh, I'm sorry, introverts to to practice, to put this into practice? You know, it, it's hard if they think that it's all about speaking one on one personally to somebody. One of the things we teach introverts is write a note, write an email. You're in control of it. You can send it when you want. You don't have to be right there in front of them. And lots of introverts, I mean, quality time is one of the major languages. Uh, 25%, 26% one out of every four employees has quality time as their primary language. And it's not, they want to be your best friend. Sometimes they just want somebody to just check in and see how you're doing. Or other times they just like to do stuff with other th people besides doing it by themselves. So all you got to do is be there. So it doesn't take, you know, you have to be an extrovert to, to make this Interesting. happen. Interesting. I appreciate that perspective. Let's switch gears for a moment here. And I want to talk about the challenges of consulting at large companies. I mean, are you making lots of broad generalizations? You know, how do you, you know, come into these large companies and, and, and affect, you know, m m micro changes on a, on a macro scale? Yeah, well, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in that at this point. Um, we started out with small companies, uh, nonprofit organizations, schools, medical facilities. We're working with hospitals. We work with, you know, the big guys now, but with the exception of one big company, all of them we've connected with some supervisor or manager in the middle. They wanted to do it with their team. We did that, became sort of a pilot that other people saw. Hey, this works. Can we do that? And and it just goes that way. So I'm not an expert on sort of big macro change, except for I mean, we started with 35 people in a training for Miller Coors. They went back to their facilities across the country and took it out, and it just sort of went, you know, sort of viral from there. So that's to me, that's the model of change that I work on. I'm not good with the big, you know, CEO stuff and don't try to make it happen. What's your, what's your feedback loop when you go into companies to consult them to, to see the effectiveness of the work that you're doing? So it's, it's both, um, you know, personal feedback from both the people that brought us in from the people that we've been training as well as, you know, we're taking metrics along the way. And, uh, uh, it, we have a, a pre post assessment of, you know, how much people feel like they're either, showing appreciation or not being shown it, uh, as well as we know, you know, things like uh, absenteeism, turnover, uh, calling in sick. Mm. Uh, more, all those red less, flags, all those indicators. Yeah. yeah. On the job, accidents, employee theft, all that kind of stuff. How do, you, how do you define culture? How do you define workplace culture? Culture is actually just the aggregate of thousands of individual interactions between people and groups of people. And so if you want to change culture, you change individual interactions and it, the interactions should, and they do, but if you want to change it, should reflect what's important to you, which is what we call values. I mean, whether that's honesty or directness or success or whatever. And a key part that people miss, I think if you think about, take it out of the workplace and just think about culture, culture involves all kinds of visual cues. I mean, colors, symbols, sayings, it includes music, it includes food. Culture is both structured. You have structured aspects. You have meetings or gatherings, and then it's spontaneous. It also has things that people just do on the spur of the moment. If it's all structured, it becomes very mechanical and sort of cold. 
if it's all spontaneous, it doesn't last because it doesn't have the backbone. So you've got to do both sort of a structure spontaneous combination to help change how people interact. Yeah. And part of that is some training. Part of it is giving them a vision of how things could be different, but uh, it's not as tough as people think. Easier said than done. I mean, it really comes down to the golden rule, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, you know, create an yep. environment where people feel appreciated and they're, they're heard and they're seen and then everything else. Like culture is not, you know, ping pong and, Beer on tap. That's that's not what it's about. You know, it's really about no. feeling valued and, and also having a clear trajectory in your career, having a clear career path that you that you have room for advancement. So I want to talk about the book business for a little bit before I bring it home here. It's not often that I get to, you know, pick someone's brain that is sold. Uh, I don't even know. What, I don't want to insult you, but at least half a million books, probably a lot more right. than that. Um, aside from, you know, financial gains you make directly from selling books, what has this done for your career and your personal brand? Um, and what advice, you know, would you give to somebody if they're deciding to write a book or not? So, so your, first of all, part of my industry, we like to say, yeah, yeah, you don't make a lot of money selling books. I mean, Amazon takes just huge chunk. So there's a, there's a reason Bezos a, is sending William Shatner to the moon and just laughing about it. Right? <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Right? It, you know, so you don't want to if you're trying to make a lot of money, books aren't the way to do it directly. Books, however, provide credibility for you to speak, to be on podcasts. To be, you know, I was interviewed by the BBC News, you know, two weeks ago, you know, and so then it sort of just grows from there. And so uh, you've got to have an alternative revenue model. Um, and what for us, that the, our online assessment has created a lot of uh, um, revenue that people want to learn about themselves and how they want to be shown appreciation. By the way, our website's appreciation at work dot com. Got all the information about it. And it's the word at not the at sign. Yes. Um, but but I think. It, it also, it, the process of writing a book helps you clarify your thinking. I mean, because you got you to gotta figure out how to organize it so that it makes sense to other people. And, um, and you get feedback from people and say, you know, this is really clear. I don't know where you're going with this and it doesn't make sense. You need to rearrange it. And so have, I tell you, a key thing is to have at least a couple of friends or family members that are uh, willing to give you honest feedback, feedback yeah. <laughs> you know, and say, Hey, you know, sort of, you know, redline this up and, and tell me what you think. That's and what you, how want. It could be you, want, you want honest feedback. Um, would you do anything differently? If you know, would you, would, would you do it? Will you do anything differently when you write your next book that you learned from writing this book? Hmm. Well, uh, I've got a, our next book's coming out in January. It was by Dr. Chapman and I and another psychologist. And I think, um, having when you write with somebody you got to make sure that you view the situation similarly we i've written two other books with three people went great but it just was great this one was tougher um because we sort of had different visions so you got to make sure the best you can early on vision and i'll tell you what here's the best suggestion for anybody and that is uh Pair up with an already best-selling author. That's good. That's that's, that's <laughs> we call that co-telling. Because I, call I, that I could have written I could have written the same book, The Five Language Appreciation, by myself. I might have sold three thousand copies. Who knows? But you know, the five love languages and Dr. Chapman and his brand, you know, provided a platform at least it's to uh, not, start not, from. And, not everybody. And not everybody. Not everybody could do that. So while we're on this line of, of advice, what's the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on every day? Wow. Well, I would say, uh, I mean, it has to do, well, okay. The one, I would say uh, there, there's an old proverb that says, he who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And I try to live that way. I try to surround myself with people that are wise, that uh, I can learn from. I pursue them. Um, and if there's somebody that's just you know, sort of an idiot or just detracting, you know, I'll, I'll distance myself. Yeah. It's about who you surround yourself with. It's your, it's your circle. And I've, and I've learned something pretty cool as I've gotten older is how small uh, the circle's gotten smaller and tighter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the people that are in that circle are truly family. And, and, and it's just, you know, when you're younger, you think you need to have quantity and you realize when you're older, it's really about the, the quality. Um, Dr. Dr. White, do you, is there is there one professional accomplishment that's like your your gold star that's the trophy on your mantle that you're most proud of? I you know recent I mean being interviewed by the BBC News and and being on their homepage that was pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, you know I, I don't know if, if it's the biggest one and we got this award winning one we passed five hundred thousand books that was pretty cool yeah. too. But uh, it's you know it's 
uh, it didn't happen overnight. I mean, I've written over 300 articles and, um, you know, somebody found me and want to know what I, I know. I think that's a real big key takeaway here. You know, thousands of articles, hundreds of papers, countless interviews. You don't just get to over half a million books and you don't get to just, you know, pitch, uh, you know, a New York Times bestseller with over 20 million books. It's like, yeah, hey, can you come join me, Dr. Paul, without without putting in the work. Without being an expert right. in your field, and I certainly appreciate that. So, Dr. Paul White, last but not least, you know, you look back on your on your life and your career and look back at those tough times, right? I mean, think about the time when you were working in your younger days at the adolescent home and, you know, it was rough and tough and you had no idea where you were going to be in life, but you knew you had to be focused and you knew those times when you're down, you had to pull yourself up and harness that tenacity to drive you forward. And you look back now with gratitude. You have a fantastic book, a fantastic career. Um, what keeps you focused? What is your compass in life? Dr. Paul White, what is your North Star? Well, my North Star is to try to uh, do and be the person that I was created to be by God and to serve others and uh, to enjoy the ride along the way. That's that second part, something I've been adding on, you know, because you can get pretty intense and focus on it and try to do the right thing. But if you don't enjoy the ride along the way, it's it's not as much fun, obviously. It's about the journey. It's about enjoying the ride. Dr. Paul White, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I certainly appreciate you and your time. Uh, I want everyone to check out his book, The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace. Uh, long title, Empowering Organizations by Encouraging People. You could find it on Amazon and uh, I guess wherever great books are sold. Where else could people find you? Where could they connect with you? Where could they learn more? And remember, guys, I'll link everything up in the show comments to make it nice and easy for everyone. Yeah, it's appreciation at work.com is sort of the mothership. And then I've also got drpaulwhite.com as well. That's awesome. Dr. White, hang with me for one moment as I sign off. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending uh, time with me and our, and our tribe today. You bet. My pleasure. Awesome. Good stuff. And everyone listening at home, thank you so much for checking out the podcast. You know where to find out more at thepodcast.com. Follow us on all the social media channels. If you like this show, leave a review rating. It goes a long way. And remember, sharing means caring. Look out for one another. Take care and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search the podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.